Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da habati fillah so I believe we are now in the fifth sitting the fourth or fifth and in our series of Tawheed wa Aqeedah by Shaykh Hamad al-Ansari and the Sheikh <clears throat> was mentioning, we said the last thing we, we talked about is Tawheed al Rububiyyah, Yastelzimu Tawheed al Uluhiyya, that the Tawheed of Lordship in necessitates. That you then, therefore, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Tawheed al uluhiya Tawheed al-Rububiya, yastalzimu, Tawheed al uluhiya That the Tawheed of Lordship necessitates that you then, therefore, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, then the Shaykh, he, he starts to detail a little bit more and talk about the first Tawheed, he says... The first obligation on human being is to learn Tawheed al-Uluhiya. He said the first obligation is that we need to learn Tawheed al-Uluhiya, and this is for all of mankind. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-Kareem, which uh, shows us, <clears throat> as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-Kareem, Ya yu al-Nas, Ya yu al-Nas a'budu, uh, Ya yu al-Nas a'budu rabbukum, Aladhi khalakum, Waladhi na min qablukum la'alakum tatukum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says for Kitab al-Kareem. Ya yu nas So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses who? Mankind. Ya yu nas Ya yu nas a'budu. Rabbukum. O you mankind, worship your Lord. Aladhi khalaqakum. The one who created you. Waladhina min qablakum. And those before you. Limadha. Why? La'alakum tatakun. In order that you will have God consciousness. You will be fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will do His commandments. You will avoid His prohibitions. So that is evidence to show that this is the most important category. This is first what we need to know. Unlike uh, some of the Ahl Kalam, they have different concepts of how you should come to terms with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the lordship of Allah, and you should think and reflect and then come to that conclusion. No, Ahl Sunnah says, you know, we go to the books, we go to the Quran, we go to the Sunnah, and we see the commandment of Allah Azza wa Jal. That he says that, and that's how we prioritize. We prioritize. We get our qawaid, our usul, our foundation principles uh, from the Quran and the Sunnah. Not we come up with our foundation principles and then we research, trying to find authentication and legitimization from the Quran and Sunnah. La, la, bilaks. It's the opposite. Ahl Sunnah has a different way of deducing aqidah. Compared to Ahl Bid'ah, like Ahl Kalam, whether that be the Asha'ira, Maturidiyah, Mu'tazila, Jahmiya, all of those uh, various groups and sects. <clears throat> so, we said, so then he said, the Shaykh, then he, he mentions, he says, uh, Indeed, worship of Allah is fearing Him. It is obligatory to know Allah with His lofty sifat, His divine uh, names and attributes. And... Indeed, Allah began his book with Tawheed and ended it with Tawheed, and that is by Surah Al Fatiha in the beginning of the, the Quran and Surah Al Nas at the end. So you can see all, all throughout the Quran <coughs> is, is referring to Tawheed. That's why it was the strangest thing when I heard that statement some years ago. I heard it in my own ears. I don't know if he clarified it from uh, Nu'man Ali Khan. When he said something like, Tawheed is not in the Quran. That's the weirdest thing I ever heard. Why? That shows jahil. That shows jahil. I'm not saying that he doesn't have any knowledge because I don't know what the man study. I don't really know much about the man. I've heard some clips. <clears throat> and, you know, it's not the time nor place to really go into detail and talk about those issues. But I would say is that was a, a manifestation of severe jahil. And there's no doubt we all can make mistakes in Akhidu. We can make a mistake, especially in intricate details. But something in the usul. Something in the Sulah, uh, 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 Ittikara Ahl Sunnah? 
Something that is so prevalent in the Quran. This is a man who has some extensive tafsir of the Quran. How in the world could you say something weird like that? And what do you mean? Do you mean that the word Tawheed's not in there? Or do you mean that Tawheed is not... I, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's Jahil and it shows Bu'ud. It shows uh, Bu'ud on the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah. And the precepts of Ahlul Sunnah. It shows... So that's, that's uh, two things. It shows... Uh, and ignorance and being far away from the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah Tibul Jama'ah. That's one. Secondly, it shows ignorance and a deviation from what, what's more important, the usul al-Tiqad Ahlul Sunnah, the asl, the foundation of the creed of Ahlul Sunnah Tibul Jama'ah. We don't care what some of these people are saying, Dr. So and so and so and so saying now about, you know, revisiting the Quran, revisiting Aqidah. We, we don't care about their, uh, their new renaissance in understanding. It doesn't fade us. But what I, we do fear for is those youth who follow the people of Bid'ah and desires. We, we fear for them. And that's why we say don't listen to a lot of those people. But the people still enjoy and listen. And then they still fall off their deen. And there's no doubt that the natija, the end result, when you listen to the people of Bid'ah and Desires, especially when they have Bid'ah Mughallada, you know, they have a severe innovation, is that these people can lead you to totally, totally <clears throat> leave uh, the religion of, of Islam or doubt the main foundation principles. This is uh, a, a severe tragedy and travesty for the youth of Ahlul Sunnah and for the youth uh, amongst the Muslims in general, because when you have the du'at ala Abu Abu Jahannam, the the the, the uh, scholars to the um, to the doors of uh, of the hellfire, that's exactly what they are, and so many people will follow them. So the Sheikh then he says it is oblig obligatory upon every individual to open a school for Tawheed in any country whatsoever, and this is the first thing that one should begin with. So that's a beautiful advice from the Sheikh, and that reminds me of what we're trying to do. And this was not a setup. Uh, is that that's why we're doing Al Athari Institute? We want this to. I want to leave this behind for my soul, that when I'm dead, bi idnillah taala, that. Hopefully it still exists and hopefully people will still derive benefit and learn something about their religion and move on to the higher sciences and move on to uh, or other, you know, more people of knowledge and stuff. But I want some of that ajr for my soul. Why? The Prophet Sallallahu said in authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, قال النبي Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam قال إذا مات المري انكتى العمله إلا من ثلاث When a person dies, his deeds cease except three. He said, uh, <clears throat> jariyah. He said, the continuous charity. So that could be building a well, that could be, uh, you know, building a masjid, doing something good like this. Uh, even that, even uh, the markas or a markas of sunnah where the people study the book in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that that also follows under that. Then that one is so so such a great reward that it can follow under both. In in fact, because the Prophet ﷺ then said, what did he say? He said, "Al uh, Elm Yuntafabi." He said, "Knowledge that the people benefit from." So he said that the second thing is that knowledge that the people benefit from. So that means that if you leave behind, for example, look at all the uh, imams of the Sunnah throughout history. It doesn't matter what new deviants uh, call into doubt about. Uh, about Bukhari and Muslim, and they say this, and they try to doubt uh, about uh, Abu Huraira, because because once you can doubt the books of the Sunnah, you can undermine the religion. Once you cause doubt about the Quran, as Doctor So and So is doing, that you can undermine Islam totally. What do you have after that? Oh, you will have just like the Jews and the Christians who, you know, I remember watching a documentary some years ago about. Uh, you know, as Christian scholars, they were talking about the authentic authenticity of the Bible. And they really traveled. They did extensive research. All of them concluded that the, that the Bible, those that, you know, because they were Christian scholars and, and maybe some secular scholars, I don't recall. And they all, the ones who are very religious still, they said, we believe 
that the Bible is inspired by the Word of God. That's very different. That's very different if you look at the, the, the implications of that statement. We believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. So then if you reduce that to the Quran, let me explain that first. So if you held this concept that it's the inspired, that means you don't believe it's the literal. And that's what he was saying. He said, it's not the literal word of God, but it's inspired. These gospels of Jacob, these gospels of Job, these gospels of this one, that these are inspired, meaning that they sat, they might have meditated, and they were inspired by righteous virtues. And that this is the word of God. So that means you can almost continue revelation if you have that kind of concept, because other people can be inspired. Some of the deviant secularists of this time, they say they're inspired by John Lennon, Bob Marley, uh, so many others. That doesn't mean they might not have had some lyrics that could have reminded you of Allah. They might have some lyrics that uh, made you reflect or gave you social consciousness. But the believers don't derive their inspiration from there. That's not what, you know, that, that's not how we form our, our religion. That's not how we reform our usul from Sufi uh, mysticists or, or, uh, or plain, uh, you know, uh, Rastafarians or uh, people who worship Haile Selassie and, and things like this. That's not our spiritual inspiration. That's not the spiritual inspiration for a Muslim. Because you'll have a lot of shirk along with whatever good they might say. Meaning they can say a statement of good. You can have good lyrics. I could, I could say, hey, I'm inspired by Tupac. Okay, Tupac had uh, a very deep, deep lyrics along with his, uh, the uh, immense uh, violence and other things and his perspectives on women and so forth. But he had very deep ghetto poetry. But that's not where you get your inspiration from. That's not going to bring you closer to Eliza or Jell. And just the asal is any way you go to the book in the sunnah. So there's a very different way of deriving creed. Now, why I mentioned this, Ahabat Tefillah, is for us also to get that understanding that that not only do we, when you go and make that claim, as those uh, Christian scholars mentioned, that the Bible is the inspired word of God, meaning it's not literal. If you take that with the Quran, and that's there's a lot of people, there's whole movements. Don't think that this is weird. There's many people who hold this concept. And this is where the guy, Dr. So-and-so, is beginning to go in this direction with his calling into doubt about the seven kira'at and, and the authenticity and what he had doubts in, in his secular studies and all these kind of weird, strange anomalies that lead to zandaka. They lead to disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they'll leave into doubt in the Quran that these kind of concepts lead to people saying, well, you know, the Quran is not literal word of God. It's just inspired. So, you know, it's just a really nice book to have in the car. It inspires my heart. I feel good when I read it, but I don't really truly believe in it. That's what people begin to, to go to that path. Or they believe, they'll say they believe in it, but they don't literally believe in it. So then they can change and make their own in reinterpretation in any kind of tafsir that will lead them to anywhere. We ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and protect us from kufr, shirk, and nifaq. And until our next sitting, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad.